Hey guys, it's Judy from Nutrition with Judy. Thanks for joining me today. While you're here, please make sure to like and subscribe. If you're listening to this on podcast, please make sure to leave a review as this allows my content to get in front of more people. And thank you for that. My name is Judy Cho and I'm board certified in holistic nutrition and I have a private practice where we focus on root cause healing and it often starts with the carnivore cures meat only elimination diet. Today I had the pleasure of sitting down with Dr. Brian Lenskis. Many of you may know him from the low carb MD podcast and a lot of the content from low carb and keto diets. Dr. Lenskis is an internal medicine doctor in San Diego. He is also board certified in Arizona. So he takes patients in both Arizona as well as California. Dr. Lenskis received a BS in biology from UC Irvine and as an MD from the USC Medical School. His frustration over the inability of standard medical advice to help patients with obesity and chronic disease combined with his own weight gain led him to the ketogenic diet and intermittent fasting. Dr. Lenskis has his own private practice where he works one-on-one with his patients, and he's also a international lecturer, as well as the co-host of the very popular Low Carb MD podcast. In this episode, Dr. Lenskis and I talked a lot about what works and what sticks in terms of what helps the individual patients and clients. I love talking with him because a lot of times it's really important to hear the latest science, whether it's keto or carnivore, some other type of wellness or diet. But after that, once we know the information, how do we make it stick? And that is something so important. And even getting rid of dogmas, because once you work with people one-on-one individually, and for a long period of time, you realize that not everything works for every single individual person. It's exactly why I really shy away from dogma because I couldn't have supported over 500 clients that are meat-based or carnivore. If I was so dogmatic and this is the way, and this is what you need to do. And that is the only way. You have to work with what makes sense for the individual person. And we get into a lot of those specifics. Dr. Lenskis shares so many different fun facts that may work for different patients. Let's get right into the interview. Hi, Dr. Brian Lenskis. I'm super excited to have you on. I've been a fan of the low carb podcast for so long. And then I saw you speak um, at Boca. So I'm super excited for my community to get to know you more. Um, if you can just introduce yourself for the people listening and watching. Hey, I'm Brian Lenskis. I'm an internal medicine doc. I've been in standard practice for 18 years and now almost 20 years now that I've been in my new practice. And, you know, I just started looking at the benefits of low carb and lifestyle change and sleep and stress control and all that. And I realized like, gosh, it's really hard in the standard system to do that. I've had struggles with weight my entire life. And so, you know, I was trying to figure it out, listening to patients and seeing what worked for them and then adopting that myself and then teaching others the same. Okay. And and that was like one of the messages that I loved about you at Boca. You talked about the importance of CGMs to help people get motivated, have things stick, you know, on the internet, I'm sure you get a lot of these people too, but it's, we, we hear like the latest science, like, oh, we actually shouldn't be eating this oil now, or we shouldn't be eating this type of sweetener now. And I know for the average person that's super busy, they don't even have time to listen to all that content. So how do we make things stick so that people can eat a lower carb diet? And really start healing. I think meeting that person where they're at. Like I have one guy, he's doing great. He actually, in this first week, he lost 4.2 pounds. And all he did was cut back on like soda drinking. You know, he didn't really change his diet that much yet. But when he saw that, he said, okay, now what what else can I do? Like now he's excited to start changing. At first, like some people want to go slowly into the, the shallow end. And some people just jump in the deep end and go. So it's really just meeting the patient where they're at and trying to figure out, you know, because... I think if you set the bar way too high, people just say, forget it. I'm not doing it. It's too much. I'm not doing it. Like if I say, okay, you could just eat meat for the rest of your life. And people say, well, I like to have, you know, something else sometimes. Is that okay? You know, so I, I think it's just really, and, and, and we're all different personality types. You know, some people are hardcore and want to jump in and other people will just get rid of one thing at a time. Can we cut back on bread? If you're drinking wine every night, can we do it two nights a week instead of seven nights a week? You know, those kind of things that aren't so dramatic where you have to give it up. Now, you know, the, the interesting thing that we, it's really been a topic in my clinic for the last couple of weeks is different personality types. There are some, and, and probably Dr. Saiv has talked about this, is, you know, saying, hey, some people cannot moderate. Yeah. They cannot moderate. So if some people have one drink and they have to have 10 drinks, they can't stop and they end up in the gutter at the end of the night. Other people can have one drink and say, okay, in two weeks, I'll have another drink and <laughs> they're fine. 
Some people are the same thing with cookies or donuts, but right. other people who can moderate, if you say, okay, zero tolerance, you can never have a cookie again or a piece of sourdough bread, then they say, forget it. I'm not doing it. It's not worth it. You know? So it's kind of figuring out which person you are. And I think that's an individualized thing that we all have to learn. And you may have, you know, not be able to moderate your cookie intake, but bread, you could have one piece and you're fine or tortilla chips are a problem for some people. So I think kind of figuring out what our kryptonite is that led us into bad health habits and then trying to change that. Right. That's, that's interesting. And I fully agree with that. So I struggle with an eating disorder before. So I completely understand that um, the mental side of it all. It's funny because it sounds like there's a lot of psychology and therapy involved in your practice and trying to figure out what helps people get motivated and what helps them tick. And how do you essentially get people to understand that, that concept, I guess, or. Yeah, I think it's just fun to see different people and how they react. Some people are science minded and they say, look, I want data. So they love to have the CGM. They love to see the, the continuous glucose monitor because they can see instantly. It's not my opinion anymore. They can look and say, oh, when I have certain foods, my sugars go crazy. And so other people can eat the same food and they don't have as much of a, a spike, right? It depends how metabolically healthy you are. So I think it's figuring out what motivates that person. The funniest thing is, you know, I have like one of my ladies, she's actually done very well, but at the beginning is she's an intensive care u- unit uh, charge nurse. Okay. So in the middle of the day, there would be no readings on her CGM. And I would see him in the morning and at night. And I say, it looks good, but and something's happening in the middle of the day. I'm not seeing it on the weekends. I see it, but not during the week. And she said, oh, because when I'm there, I have candy. There's a candy dish and I don't want you to see it. Right. <laughs> I'm like, it's still having the same physiologic effect on your weight loss and diet and sugars but she didn't want me to see it. And so once she came back and, you know, she took the time off for the holidays, came back and crushed it. And she had that mm-hmm. CGM on all the time because some people, they don't want to see it go up and other people are afraid that I'm going to see it going up. So the psychology is, it's pretty interesting. So one of my guys who's been doing fantastic, his, uh, his continuous glucose monitor fell off and he couldn't get one for a couple of days. And he goes, I had the best desserts in my life during those two days. Cause I knew I couldn't see it and you couldn't see it. Right. The mentality of that. Right. So sometimes just having that there as a reminder, like, Oh, if I eat that, I'm going to see it. I don't want to see it. Right. Competitive people. Right. And then other people are, they don't want to disappoint, like don't want to disappoint the teacher. So they said, Oh, you're going to see it. If I go you know, cause a lot of people with eating disorders, they'll, they'll sneak off in the closet and eat some stuff. Right. And, and think, Oh, no, one's going to notice. I'll just kind of have a few bites. But when you see your sugar spike to 200, then all of a sudden you say, Oh, I don't want to do that anymore. Yeah. yeah. So it's fun to see that. And some people love a lot of data. Some people weigh themselves uh, a lot just to see, and they know it's going to go up and down and, you know, hydration levels and all that stuff. And other people get really stressed when they see it. So, you know, it is like some people say, weigh yourself every day. Other people say only do it once a month or once a week. And it just depends on the person because some people thrive in one environment, but they get destroyed in another. Right. Do you think that for many of your patients that the CGM has been a big mover or a big lever in terms of changing habits and behaviors? Yeah, it's the biggest lever I have. You know, e- even the scale, like we, I, I'm set up in my practice to do, you know, 24 hours. Yeah, you can, you know, scale weight will come to me, blood pressure, all those okay. things. But the best marker is sugars because it's, instantaneous because you can look back at someone's week and say what happened Wednesday what happened today? and we can go through it and, and and figure out oh that big spike of sugar was from exercise great that's good and people can see that I'm like you're just seeing it on the freeway getting ready to be burned in the muscle who cares it's not a big deal but other times they say yeah you know I was at my sister-in-law's house and you know and, and I can see it and some people I'm really concerned if they're you know, poorly controlled diabetic, I can have it come directly to my phone. So it'll say, oh, there's a message. Mm-hmm. The sugars are high, like, you know, four times today. So I can call them and say, hey, what's going on? Oh, my brother's law is in town. Okay, I'm going to be good from now on. Okay, you're right, right? Because they may not even be looking at it. So it's a really great uh, monitoring tool because all the time, like one of my guys just yesterday, he, 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 he puts keto cereal and his sugars go crazy. Keto cereal, sugars go crazy. I'm oh, like, really? do you think that's a keto cereal? <laughs> <laughs> even though it says on the package, it's not. Or, you know, cauliflower crust pizza, like people will get that. And a lot of times they're using tapioca starch right. or something that's spiking them. Like, like they're about having regular pizza. So they think they're doing the right thing. But the only way to know is to really monitor it. I agree. I, I think it's so powerful. Um, so are these CGMs? Because I know that, like, for example, I'll work with some of my clients and they'll order it from NutriSense, but they're primarily paying out of pocket. The ones that you get, are they covered by insurance? Some are. Okay. Most of the time, not. Most of my okay. patients are cash pay. <clears throat> so they just okay. go on and it's, you know, I think at CVS and Costco, a lot of times it's $70 for a month. Oh, you know? okay. So oh, I didn't even you realize. Can, okay. 
Yeah, if for for the freestyle Libre is the one I use just because it's cheaper. I mean, you know, if I can get the Dexcom and their insurance covers, it, I'll do it. But if they're non-diabetic, most likely insurance isn't going to cover it. Right, right. So that's the problem. If you're not on insulin, well, my goal is to keep you off of insulin. So if we can catch it early and not go on insulin, then I don't want you to have an indication to have the continuous glucose monitor. So a lot of people just pay cash. And, you know, I said, some people will say, hey, let's try it for two weeks and see what you think, you know, if you like it or not. And I was like, okay, I want to keep doing that because they can see the response of different foods and what happens. And then they know, and then they can adjust their diet accordingly. And then, you know, there's some, I've had people that think they're drinking diet Coke, for instance, at the restaurant and it's regular Coke and they see their sugars go crazy or, oh, you know, sweet iced tea sweetened with, with an artificial sweetener, but they, they're actually getting sugar and they know it, you know, and cause they see it right away and they say, Oh, you know, and all the time, it's just funny because one of my patients, as an example, she had, um, a poke bowl and said, no sauce. No, and she was so good. And her friend said, are you going to eat your rice? She said, no, here, take all my rice. So she gave her friend all the rice. And the friend said, here, you could have my cucumber salad. So all she had was a cucumber salad and fish basically. And her sugar spiked. So she figured out, oh, they put sugar in the, in the cucumber salad. salad. And so then she knows, okay, next time I go, I won't have that. So she can make those changes because she's trying to get metabolically healthier. And, And so otherwise she would keep doing the same thing without really knowing the effect on her physiology. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense. There's in the scientific um, community, there's some people that say there's not a big deal with the spikes. I just wanted to know your thoughts. I mean, we're talking so much about the CGM, so maybe we can talk some ranges, but there's some people that say it's okay if your blood sugar goes up to 150, as long as it comes down right away. I mean, what are your thoughts with that? I think I'll I'll hedge and say it depends, right? So looking at certain patients, if you're diabetic and your sugars are out of control, right? That, that, so like, for instance, that couple, they've been great for a month and they, they both had it. Like the wife had a donut, the husband had half a donut, but his half a donut, he had half a donut, but he also had a piece of string cheese with it. She was fasting and went straight into the donut. Her sugar mm-hmm. spiked like, it came down pretty quickly, but his hardly, I wouldn't have known it. I wouldn't have known he had a donut unless I knew, I mean, I put their, their tracings right next to each other. And, and I would not have picked it up on his, on hers. I said, what happened on Wednesday on his, I said, Oh, you know, you probably had a few extra carbs. So it's not the sugar spike that I'm worried about. It's the physiologic response to that. So if I see, for instance, her, her sugar response was very drastic up and down. So I know she spiked her insulin. Her body panicked when it's all that much sugar. Sure. Spiked the insulin like crazy to get rid of that sugar. And then she got a, even a little bit of low afterwards because she overshot it. Her husband's slow, half the, the height and came down slowly. So he didn't spike the insulin as much. So ultimately our goal is to make people as insulin sensitive as possible. Right. The more you're spiking your sugars up, the more you have to spike up your insulin. The more your insulin's high, the more insulin resistant you become. So looking at it from that perspective, yes, I agree. You could say, yeah, sugar spike. I, as a matter of fact, one of my patients, her, when I looked at her continuous glucose monitor the, after the first month, I was like, oh my gosh, what have you been doing? And then it said OT, OT. And whenever it says OT, then she gets this big spike. That was orange theory. Whenever she was doing orange theory workouts, oh. her sugar spiked for the workout. Is that bad? No, of course not. It's physiologic. So I, I think that's the problem is you have to understand the physiology to really understand what's happening when you see sugar tracings. Because for instance, a lot of times when people are low carb or fasting, their sugars are higher in the morning and they start getting worried about that. They say, oh my gosh, my sugars are high in the morning. Well, your body's freeing up energy for you to burn. Yes. Who cares? <laughs> it's okay. Because it's gonna you're going to normalize that. And then when they eat their lunch or whatever they're going to eat, and it's low carb, their sugars drop after they eat, right? Because they don't have to be dependent on your liver kicking out sugar all the time. Right. They're going to say, okay, I'll take this food you gave me and I'll burn that. So, so yeah, I, I can understand why people are saying it, but I think it's a lack of understanding of the physiology when they say, oh, sugar spikes don't matter. Well, to some degree it can, because I ha- as a matter of fact, just as an example on the other side, I have a physician that I got consulted on from uh, Texas and her sugars were crazy high all the time. It was really, really high. She weighs 96 pounds and she's a super, like she does CrossFit for three hours a day or something. And so, and she's super low carb. And I was like, okay, here's your problem is your body is stressing out so bad. It's causing a huge stress response. Slow down the exercise a little bit and liberalize your carbs. She said, my sugar's already high. I said, liberalize your carbs and they'll come down. And she did cut back on her exercise, did more like a a weight bearing exercise for half an hour instead of three hours, everything normalized. (laughs) <laughs> right. So you don't want to put, you know, that was just telling us that she was putting too much stress on her body on a thin person that your body was freaking out, trying to find energy somewhere because she has no fat. Right. Out of yeah. curiosity, was that patient not able to sleep through the night? I mean, what was the reason why? Because she, I mean, it sounds like she was fit. Like what would be the reason why she started working with you? 
because her sugars were crazy and she didn't know what to do about okay. it. She goes, I hear you talking about continuous glucose monitor. Look at my tracings. I looked at okay. them and said, oh my okay. gosh, your sugars are crazy. Like, you know, if, if you don't, if I didn't see her, I would say she's a 400 pound diabetic, right? And she weighs 96 pounds, but it was just the stress of, you know, just trying to pull energy from somewhere and the body was freaking out, spiking the cortisol, all this, you know, and she felt better when she cut back on her exercise. So some, some of us can be too hardcore, and then you start paying a price for that. Yeah, no, I agree with that. There's a handful of people in the carnivore space, very, very athletic, worked out a lot, very, very lean, um, ate like more of the leaner protein. So they weren't even getting more of the fat. So they weren't eating a ketogenic version of carnivore. And with uh, fast forward time, the demand for the energy was so high, they weren't eating any carbs. And then all of a sudden they felt that their thyroid was tanking too much cortisol was outputted. And like you said, it was the same things that that lady was going through. And so instead they, the ironic thing is they added a bunch of carbs. So I don't know how that's faring for them, but they were moving up to two to 300 grams of carbs and saying that this is a better way of eating. So there's a lot of stuff that we just don't know. There's a lot of uh, interactions between our hormonal system and our gut. So menopause, for instance, screws up the gut microbiome too, or stress or not sleeping, all those things. And then fasting actually helps it. So some of the benefits of fasting may not just be from lowering insulin and lowering your caloric intake. It may be resetting your physiology a bit. So it, it, there's a lot we just don't understand hundred percent yet, but we see it benefits. So it's working. Yeah, no, it makes sense. Are there other level levers that you recommend your um, patients other than diet? So, I mean, is it sleep stress? I mean, are there other big levers that you see help people to improve, I guess, their life? Yeah, I think stress is the big one. That's one I've been, as a matter of fact, I, I'm giving a talk in August in, in San Diego. And, oh, okay. you know, I was looking at the effects of, because I see what, what I do is, I, you know, I'm a clinician, I'm not a researcher, right? So when I see some of my practice, I say, well, that's weird. Everyone who's stressed out gains weight or, or slows their weight loss, like, always. And, you know, coming from a very stressful job, I say, well, maybe that was even doing low carbon keto, maybe that's part of the reason things are slower for me than other people. And a lot of it's genetics and, you know, habits and all that kind of stuff. So I really started looking into the stress and how the effect of stress, stress screws up the gut microbiome, stress screws up the stress hormones. Right. And so when you start looking at the effect of stress, I, I mean, I really think if people get it because it all goes together, really, because if you're not sleeping, you get more stress. So you get more stress, you, you know, so we're all cranky when we don't sleep and we we're not eating. Right. Right. So, <clears throat> so it all kind of plays in the same role, but I'm, but what we find is in low carbon keto, the biggest surprise to me was people's mood got better. They go, you know, my mood. And now we have data on that, you know, uh, Dr. Palmer, Chris Palmer and, and uh, Georgia Eat are, are publishing data and writing a book on the mental aspects of mm -hmm. depression, anxiety, stress, getting better on when you get your diet right. So, you know, when I start seeing that, I think, well, if I'm a stress eater and I get the stress better, then I don't have to stress eat as much because people who are more content and happy aren't thinking I mean, when you're getting a massage, you're not thinking about eating. <laughs> necessarily, right? Most people. So when you're distracted, when you're busy, when you're happy, when you're out doing stuff, uh, but when you're stressed, people, oh, I'm stressed, give me a cookie, right? right. I'm stressed, I need right. something because that makes you feel better. So what is if the stress gets better? Then you don't need that stress eating. And so what we find is people with lack of family support and stress and depression, you know, they're going to eat more because it has to do with the dopamine response in the brain. And, you know, you think about it like alcohol. Some people have one drink and they're good. They go, okay, I'm good. I feel good. I don't have to have five because some people need five to get to that same little level of dopamine release in the brain. And the same thing goes for pizza or cookies. Like some people need six other people have half a cookie and they go, okay, that was good. I tasted it and I enjoyed it. Right. So it's really a, an individual thing. So yeah, it, it's, it's just very interesting when, when you start looking at how we're so different and that's what our job is to look back and go, what's going to work for this person. Cause some right. people are just one personality, like, you know, a triathlete personality. Other people just want to go for a little walk every now and again, you know? So the other lever would be exercise, obviously, you know, Ben Bickman talked about it. I asked him, I go, Ben, if I want to live a long life, what do I got to do? And he goes, okay, five things, Brian. Right. It was number one, don't run around like a crazy person working too much and being stressed all day. I'm thinking, okay, I'm working 16 hour days at work. Right. And, and I know that get enough sleep. Uh, get up at four 30 in the morning so I can get downtown, you know, a four, 40 minute drive from my house. And then I have to get home. Then I want to spend time with my wife. So I'm up till late and then I get up early and then you get into that cycle. Right. Then he said, exercise regularly. Like what we were doing that morning when we got together, uh, don't smoke or drink to excess. Right. And eat real food. He goes, that, that's what you have control over. So that's why I, 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 I push all that to my page to go, look, here's the five things you can control. Maybe one of these you can't control right now. Maybe you have a new baby and you're just not going to get good sleep just the way it is. So we can still uh, leverage the other 
factors that we can, that we do have control over. Yeah. I love that. I love that you work with real people because a lot of the people on the, the research, it's, you know, they're, they're, they're looking at the research and I I get it. There's um, a lot of that will help us further, um, I guess the levers with our, our, our clients and our patients, but really it's the individual people that then challenge our way of thinking and realizing that things don't always work as we think, but it's true. I, when I, as soon as the pandemic hit, you see people really stressed out and then they're all of a sudden like, I'm not keto. I'm just doing the diet that works for me or, you know, the, any excuse to start because they're really stressed out because of the pandemic. We don't know what's going to happen. And people just started derailing of, well, I might as well enjoy what I'm going to eat if I'm not going to survive another day. And there was a lot of that. And I saw mm-hmm. that. And I agree with you with all the other levers. I, you know, really respect Dr. Bickman. In terms of the stress, how, like, I've had a lot of clients tell me, well, everyone's stressed. So like stress is just normal. How, how do you recommend them lowering their stress levels? Yeah. You know, that's the thing is when I started looking at this and there's a good study that, that I'm speaking about, but they show seven different ways where stress screws up insulin sensitivity. So you get more insulin resistant, the more stressed you are. And it works through the cortisol axis, the, the renin angiotensin system for, for blood pressure. Uh, you know, and it is very interesting, like how it affects, all, it, it directly causes inflammation in the, the beta cells in the pancreas, which make insulin. So you make poor quality insulin. You need to make a lot more of it. You know, you'd rather make a little bit of good quality insulin. So, so stress has a huge role. I think we've underestimated stress that's physiologic. It's not just because you get stressed and you eat more, but mm-hmm. if you do get stressed and you eat more and you're more insulin resistant, now you're in a bad situation because it's going to get worse and worse. And you're going to need more and more insulin to get rid of that sugar. And then your insulin is a fat storage hormone. So then we have more of that. So let me get back to your question. What are levers that you've recommended? Oh yeah. Because people say, well, everyone's stressed in this world, right? Stress is such a um, it's not an, a very specific thing for people to overcome. So are there levers or recommendations you normally give your clients or patients um, in terms of reducing their stress levels? Yeah, I think that's a huge thing. And I think a, a lot of it is your perspective, right? How, how you're looking at life. Some people in the same situation, they go, okay, this is like for me, <clears throat> certain things aren't stressful to me. Like they may be really stressed to other people. I'm like, okay, as long as they're breathing and they have a pulse, then we could do something, right? But other people you know, it's really like they see blood and they pass out. Right. So it just depends on, on how you internalize stress. And I think a big thing, and it sounds so silly, but just counting your blessings and saying, okay, look, you know, it's a lockdown. I have a house. I'm, you know, I have a family who loves me. I have good friends, whatever it is looking out to those things. Cause you're right. So many people got so isolated that they didn't see a human face for months. Like right. some of my seniors, they didn't see a human face for a month. And then we do a zoom meeting and they start crying because they see you and your, your smile, you know? And so and saying, okay, in, in the day, can you do that? I mean, it could be anything silly. Like I ask people, the first time I meet them, I say, what do you do for fun? Painting, work in the yard, garden. What, what do you enjoy doing? What's your passion? Collecting stamps. I don't care. Just do that. If you like doing puzzles and that relaxes you, great. I have a guy who lost weight because he started doing Legos with his son after dinner instead of snacking, mm-hmm. right? And so different things like that. One of my patients who's a psychiatrist started knitting and she lost weight. Not because knitting burns that many calories is because it kept her from snacking or thinking about food and she, and she it relaxed her and probably calmed her stress hormones. And I'm telling you that the, you know, one of my guys is a CFO of a huge company. He took a week off, ate terrible food the whole week with his, but he was relaxing with his family, but he said, no calls. I don't want to hear about the problems. If my place burns down, it does tell me in a week. I don't want to hear from you guys. Cause for the last 25 years, every day he's on call. He wants to have dinner with his wife and he returns four calls during dinner. It's like that. Right. He's not stressed out. It's just that he's constantly thinking and doing things. So during this week off, he ate terrible. And I was laughing because his, his tracings were terrible on his continuous glucose monitor. He had biscuits and gravy with his brother-in-law. Then they had French fries one day. So he was there for 10 days and he lost 8.8 pounds in 10 days. Wow. <laughs> Even eating that way. Even eating terrible. So I was like, <laughs> it's not just the diet. Stress right. is a huge factor. That's when I saw that. I'm going to say at the same week, and, and this is how it works sometimes, you make observations and you say, okay, in the same week, this guy lost all this weight. My other patient who's a nurse and she had to give a, she's a nurse practitioner and had to give a talk in front of a big group. So on Friday, and she has a Dexcom and her uh, it's a continuous glucose monitor, her sugars are perfect like all day, the day before, like they normally are. On Saturday, her sh- her baseline sugars went from around 90 to 180. And then it spiked to 220 and stayed up for that little while. And then it came down one hour later. I'm like, what the heck did you eat? What did you do? And she said, 
I had to give a talk. She's I fasted all day and I was oh, wow. super stressed all day because I knew I had to give this talk on an area that I'm not really comfortable with. Mm-hmm. So the start of she started at three o'clock and ended at four o'clock her talk. Her sugars were up that entire time. As soon as she ended her talk, her sugars came down below baseline and returned to normal. Right. And she ate dinner and her sugars dropped after dinner. So it was showing that she was having a huge stress response. So how many of us go through life with a huge stress response all day? Right. So I, I tell people, how do you, can you simplify? Because I have a lot of people that will retire, for instance, and they say, okay, and they're doing great. And all of a sudden now they have to babysit five days a week. And then they, they're on the committee for, you know, the, the board for their apartment building or whatever, you know, and, and, and so they get so stretched out again. They're like, I don't have time for myself again. Like I retired for a reason. And other people say, oh, what am I doing today? I don't know. I'm going to go to Home Depot and they're chill and they're relaxed and they, their blood pressure and everything starts getting better because the stress effect. So yeah, the, the, some, some things that you can do sauna, like if you could do sauna for 15 minutes, a couple days a week, that makes a difference. It increases exercise tolerance. There's a lot of benefit, increases nitric oxide in the, in the blood vessel to protect against heart disease and, you know, dementia, there's studies on all this stuff. So I think we just haven't really focused on that enough, you know, exercise for sure, for, for sure. A lot of people, they use that for their stress relief. And, and I think that may be a big part of the effect we see with exercise is that it calms the stress hormones, allows you to think a little bit, get out and shut your brain down maybe, and, you know, listen to music or a podcast or something along those lines that just helps you to calm down and, and take a breath. So I'll tell people, take a breath. Like I've noticed that is that my middle-aged, you know, real estate agent, like while we're in a consult, she's here typing, hold on, doctor, I got to send this email. I'll be right with you. Hold on just a second. Like every time. And then you're 10 minutes like, I'm so sorry. I was running with a client. I got, and, and then, but they don't have success because I think they're spiking their stress hormones and they're, you know, it's hard. So once people calm down a little bit and take a breath and say, okay, everything's all right, whatever, faith, yoga, meditation, I don't care what it is, find your peace somewhere. I love that. Um, and then the sleep lever is a really tricky one. There are, I, for example, sleep so much better now that my blood sugar is a lot more balanced eating a keto carnivore diet. But there's a lot of people that'll say, now that I'm lower carb, I can't sleep through the night. My hormones are messed up. Have you noticed that with some of your patients and how, if someone is not, you know, everything else looks beautiful being a ketogenic eater, but their sleep is now messed up. Maybe they're just having too much cortisol at the end of the night. What have you recommended in order for them to start improving that sleep aspect? Well, yeah, there's, there's so many things, you know, there's a, uh a company I like called Biotic Quest. I don't have any financial interest in them, but they they have one called Simple Slumber. It's a probiotic that will make mm-hmm. melatonin and serotonin, helps you sleep through the night and then it wears off in the morning. So people go, oh my gosh, I'm sleeping better. And, and interestingly enough, they have a product called Sugar Shift that I use for, it, it basically puts gut microbiome in that helps block the conversion of, um, it basically converts fructose and glucose in the gut before you absorb it uh, to mannitol, okay. which is mostly a non-absorbable sugar. So- People will tell me they start that and they say, my sugar cravings go away at night. I don't feel like eating that. Or I sleep better at night. I'm so much more calm. And, and it's like, and people, it's a palpable difference. And the sugars drop, you know, it does drop the sugar about 10 points. They just did a, a study on it. So I'm thinking they didn't look at insulin levels. So I'm like, you know, what? let me use this on my patient and see what the insulin level does. Um, it, because I know it's dropping because I'm seeing people break plateaus and feeling better, you know, and, and so that, and there's another one that Bitten Johnson told me about, uh, the, and, and I don't know if you know who Bitten Johnson is. She's an addiction specialist and she, and she has a lot of anxiety and she started using this thing. It's called the, the, um, I probably have it sitting here. It's a silly thing. It's called the relaxator. It's just a little like pacifier and it's just, a uh, resistance, right? So it helps you take a breath and relax. So, so she used it when she, like when she used to get panic attacks, answering emails. And then she says, she puts, she, she, that you breathe in through your nose and you blow out through this. And what it does, interestingly, the physiology is that when you, it, it, like in the old days, when someone had a panic attack, they would give them a, a paper back to breathe right. into. Because what it does is builds up your carbon dioxide level. And when you build up your carbon dioxide level, it makes you release more oxygen to your tissues and it's calming, right? So if you're hyperventilating all day in stress, you're blowing off carbon dioxide. And so you have a low carbon dioxide level, then you're more likely, once it hits a certain threshold, you're more likely to have a panic attack. So she's been using that. And I thought that's the craziest thing, but I've had patients that has really helped them. A silly thing like that saying, okay, just breathe. 
<laughs> just breathe, you know, like, we, you know, like Wim Hof, some other people who do right. deep breathing or they do the water, you know, go on ice cold water and control their breathing. And, and those things help. So it's just kind of figuring out what works for that individual person. You know, some people are going to say, I'm not going to walk around with this in my office, but other people have their own office and they could just do whatever they want to do, you know, and some people do a little exercise break or stretch or do whatever, just to, just to bring the nerves down a little bit. But the other thing I'm actually really intrigued with, I have one lady, she wasn't having success. And it was a struggle. And then she retired. And then she's kind of that story of, you know, babysitting all the time, being busy. And she couldn't sleep. She just could not sleep. And she was miserable. And, you know, all the sleeping medicines we use make things worse. So one of her clients had used a, a stim device on the ear lobes, right? 15, 20 minutes. It's been shown to help with, with PTSD, anxiety, depression, and sleep. All these things are interrelated, right? So she started using it. And I saw her on a Zoom meeting because she's in Northern California. And I looked, I'm like, what? You look great. What's going on? And she said, I'm sleeping through the night. And just sleeping through the night, her cravings got, everything got better yeah. on her journey because she started sleeping. And this little device, she uses it for 20 minutes a day and she sleeps through the night. So things like that, you go, gosh, what works for you ultimately? You know, right. so I think trying something to not, not just give up because insomnia is a huge, huge problem. And I don't think it's necessarily from the dietary change necessarily, but for instance, alcohol, if I have a couple glass of wine at night, I wake up at two in the morning. I just do. And it's probably because being keto and low carb, you probably drop your sugars and that wakes you up and your body says, oh, your sugars are low. You got to do something. Uh, fasting, some people will notice that they don't sleep as much. But some people will notice they sleep less, but they have more energy too. And they're not tired and they're not dozing off anymore. So it's just really individualized, you know, individual, how you respond to those lifestyle changes. Yeah. I think all of those are really cool tips. I got to find that little contraption you did because I would love to recommend that to my clients. It makes so much sense. I know that you work with a lot of the community that maybe isn't well to do. So maybe they can't even afford a CGM or afford all these fancy devices, or maybe they're not too fancy, but how do we support people to have wellness for all? I, I'm a firm believer that everyone has the opportunity. I mean, you can eat just ground beef, the cheapest kinds, eggs at the most conventional and like the simple plain butter. And while it may not be perfect, quote unquote, um, but people will still heal compared to eating any of the processed foods. So how do you support the community that may not have either, whether it's a lot of time or a lot of resources in terms of financials? Yeah, that's a hard thing. And I think it's, it's reaching out to, it really comes down to education. I did, I don't know if you've heard about this, but I did, um, I had 23 females in Vacaville, California, which is a farm community. And, you know, they were basically farm workers and they were all from Mexico and, out of the 23, 17 didn't speak English, mm -hmm. right? And so the owner of the company said, hey, all, all these women have diabetes. They have all these other health problems. Do you think you can help them? And I said, well, you know, I'd love to, but you know, I'm in Southern California, but we could do Zoom meetings and I can. So I just set it up and I had Ben Bikikio, the workout guy, do a, a, a talk for them. And I did some talks and educate them and just say, hey, look, what can we change? What are you doing now? And having the, the, the owner of the company pay for all their continuous glucose monitors. So mm -hmm. We could see it in every week we do, we do a Zoom meeting like this. And I'll go, okay, who wants to show their sugars for the week? And like someone goes, oh, show me what you did. And then we'd see it and we'd talk about, it, look at this. And so we could educate everyone based on a couple, you know, tracings that we looked at. And what we saw is that they improved. I mean, a lot of them were coming off insulin, coming off their diabetes medicine, their moods improving. It, it was unbelievable. And it wasn't that we had, to, I mean, they're on a fixed budget. So fortunately for me, I, I saw, I said, can you, before we start, I said, can you show me a picture of your break room? And I looked, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is a, this, they had like, you know, monster drinks and, you know, everything was processed garbage food. And like, that's what your people are eating. No wonder they're exhausted all the time. And so Ben Bickman and a couple of the other, you know, companies said, hey, we'll send you stuff. Keto Mojo sent free monitors for them. And we helped the community and they got better and they're still continuing. They didn't do a biggest loser where they, who could lose the most weight. And I kept in, mm -hmm. you know, hitting them saying, look, it's not about the biggest loser because one of you was the biggest loser last year when you did a, you know, whatever challenge and you gained all your weight back plus some, that's not what you want. You want a sustainability. So if you're eating 12, to, I have one lady, she lost 32 pounds during 16 weeks and it came off all of her meds and everything. And I said, how many tortillas were you eating a day? And she's oh, about 20, I'm like 20 a day. And she's yeah, 20, like, you know, six at lunch, six at dinner. Yeah. Right. It adds up. And she goes, yeah, we would just, so she cut that out and, and she just destroyed it. And, they gave up green drinks every morning. They were spiking their sugars like crazy when they saw it. That's why I like to even, before we start doing low carb, say, put on the continuous glucose monitor, do your normal diet for three or four days. And then we'll switch over. And when they see it, they say, oh my goodness, like they see it flatten out, right? They, so yeah, so like eggs are cheap. 
right? You can get ground beef. I have one guy who lost a hundred pounds eating ground beef. He would, he's a single guy, doesn't like to cook. So he would just on the weekend, make a bunch of ground beef, right? He would just, he would just cook a, a bunch. And then on Monday, he would have it with a Mexican sauce on Wednesday. He would have it with a Asian sauce. So like he would change. He's eating the same thing all and it's cheap. And he goes, this is the best thing ever. Like, it, cause he had done liquid diets and lost a ton of weight and getting it all back. And now he's sustaining it. So yeah. It, cause you want to sustain your muscle mass because right. you can lose weight quickly. Right. If you eat 300 calories a day, you'll lose weight quickly, but you're losing muscle mass and then you lose your metabolic rate. And then when you start eating a little bit more, you gain weight and you're, you're more insulin resistant because you, know, you see those a lot of the low. When you look at the, the medically supervised diet plans, you know, liquid diet plans, you see how much sugar and garbage stuff is soybean oil and corn right. oil and all kinds of stuff in there. Right. It's the cheapest stuff they can possibly get. So people lose weight, but it's, they're not, they're losing their muscle mass and their metabolic rate and they're, they're getting more insulin resistance. So it's been fun to look at continuous glucose monitor on those patients after they've done that. And you see the response they get compared to my other patients and then how that response changes over time. And, in, 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 you know, in the next three or four weeks where, where they can actually respond to exercise and release sugar from their fat stores instead of being dependent on that sugar that they're eating. And you said that that person that just loves ground beef or can tolerate just eating ground beef. He lost a hundred pounds mm-hmm. over a hundred pounds. Making... Oh, wow. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah. And that's what he does. And it's simple. And he goes, yeah, sometimes I'll wrap it in lettuce. Sometimes I get, you know, he goes out and has, you know, salmon or something like that because that's my staple. That's what I do. Can that's I keep awesome. doing that? His cholesterol improved doing that. His sugar's got better as insulin. See, it, it's mind blowing for people. Right. You know, cause a lot of people, you know, they'll say I'm afraid of eating eggs because of the cholesterol, but their A1C is 7.9, you know? So it's like, we have to fix that problem. You have to right. fix the insulin, the A1C. We know that's devastating, you know, the, the effects of diabetes. So yeah, there's trade-offs in life. Yeah. Well, and also yeah. I think it was in 2015, the dietary guidelines, they removed the cap on cholesterol levels. So, I mean, there's technically no cholesterol as much as people are still scared of cholesterol. There's no <clears throat> upper requirements for cholesterol. So I don't think people need to necessarily <clears throat> be scared. I think it's always when it's paired with too many carbs. Um, in terms of, you know, the prices are going up nowadays. Do you find, I mean, I guess ground beef, buying all the ground beef is one option, but do you find ways for people to make this more affordable in terms of keto foods or even meat, meat foods? Yeah. You know, I think one thing that that I think is great that I, that I personally do is, you know, I find a local rancher Mm -hmm. and buy a cow from them. It's not have to ship all across the country. You know, I do buy stuff from some, you know, have some shipped in sometimes, you know, but there's ways to do it. If you know ranchers and, and you can get a better deal, a lot of, believe it or not, it's cheaper than you can get it at the store a lot of times. And, and it's fresh, good meat that, that was raised in the, you know, grass fed or whatever. Right. <clears throat> so, and they care for the animal, they treat them well. And, you know, I mean, there's ethical considerations and all this too. Right. So yeah, some people will just, you know, it's hard because of the you know, cost of everything's going up, but you know, most people, they, they figure out what works. They go, okay, if I can't afford grass fed, I just get ground beef, right? Or I get the cheaper cuts and you'll see there's certain cuts that, that of meat that are pretty cheap that you can get, you know? And, and even if you get a bad cut of meat, if you have an instant pot, you could throw it in there and, and, you know, it, it becomes tender and you can make your chili out of it or whatever, you know, right. there's, there's other ways around it and people figure out, I think, you know, Maria Emmerich's done a good job of, of having a bunch of recipes that are reasonable because, you know, some, some, some of the keto recipes out there, you look, it's like, well, it's going to take me two hours to make that. I don't have time for that. Like people are busy. They don't have time. So it's figuring out like, and I think the big thing really uh, from an economical standpoint, <clears throat> excuse me, is <clears throat> cooking at home, not going out right. to dinner every night. You know, it adds up. Yeah, no, no, no. I, I agree with that. I think that makes sense. And I mean, we do the same thing. We order from our local rancher. I think one, I wanted to support the local rancher. So there's not a middleman. I wanted to ask you really quickly about the CGM. So I found some clients do really well. So they are really open eyed with all the things they see in the CGM, but then fast forward like two months and they're no longer using a CGM and they kind of start going back to the habits because they, um, so within your practice, have you seen that too, where people start like forgetting the CGM spikes that they had seen, or do you recommend that they use a CGM, uh, f- you know, forever in the future in a sense? Um, what, what have you seen kind of works for your patients? Yeah, I think it's a, it depends on the person. Yeah. Like some okay. person, people that keeps them accountable <laughs> and they see that and they go, I'm, and so some people are like, I'm always going to have this thing. Okay. Like, you know, most of us, when we get our diet, you figure it out say, okay, I don't need it. Most of my patients after a time, but if you plateau or start going up, I'm like, okay, let's look at the CGM data. Let's try that again and see what, where you're at. 
because then they realize, oh, you know, I have been having more nuts and oh, I have been having more. And you don't realize it at the time. Right. Or I have been, you know, taking Friday nights off more or whatever. But when you see it, then you go, OK, what happened here? What happened here? And they can see it. Right. So so I think it's a valuable tool to keep us on track or get us on. If you're on track and you're running and you're, you're you know, I mean, some people I look at I go, why do you even have this on? Look at your sugars are just flat all day. Nothing's changing. Why do you even have this? You go, because if I take it off, I'll eat that day. Mm-hmm. And they know themselves. So sometimes you just learn, you know. Yeah. You no, know? No, no, so no. most people don't need it forever. It's just like ketones. I don't check it very often unless. You know, I, you know, we had a bunch of birthday parties or something, right? We ate out to dinner a couple of times. And I'll say, okay, where am I? Just get back on track. You know, okay, I'll fast for a day and get my ketones back up. So it's just kind of figuring out where, where you're at and what works for you ultimately, you know, and most people don't need it once they figure out, I think it's the, the, the most valuable times when you first start. But as a matter of fact, the funny, I was at a, a low carb conference. It may have been Boca. I'm trying to think where it was. Anyways, we, we were there and they had low carb um, cake. And I did, and I'm like, I don't want that. I didn't have it. I was talking and I caught discussion with someone and everyone. And, and so one of the guys asked me, he's like, Brian, do you think it's sensible to wear this CGM all the time? I'm like, yeah, for some people it's really helpful, you know? And so we got into this discussion so that him and the, there's two guys who were, who were questioning whether it's useful to use the CGM. Both of them came up to me and showed me their sugar readings. Go look at this from last night. I had that cake. It wasn't low carb. And then the other guy goes like, Hey, Brian, do you see this? Look at my tracing. <laughs> so they saw it. So they're the ones who were questioning the usefulness. And they both said, man, I wouldn't have never known because, you know, if you buy that cake and you say, oh, I'm getting this low carb cake every time and you never check it, you have to confirm that it's not that it is because a lot of people don't know. They say, well, it's low carb because it's gluten free. Well, it's not, it's not low carb, (laughs) but sugar in it. So, you know, things like that where it's helpful, where, you know, if the, if things aren't on the right track and you you can look at it and say, okay, what's happening physiologically to me, you know? And, And so that's the benefit. And, you know, the other, if I'm not doing the CGM, the other thing I'll check is an insulin level. And if I see that start creeping up again, I go, either you're not exercising, or you're stressed or you're eating more carbs. There's no other way around that. Yeah, it makes sense. I think the CGM really simplifies, you know, there's a lot of practitioners that'll say, oh, you have to look at neck um, neck carbs or you look at the fiber or you look at the type of sugar, but, or you could just say, eat whatever you want, use the CGM and determine if that food is actually right for you, if it makes sense for you. So I think it really simplifies things and it makes it very individualized. And I think that's why I've just slowly started really introducing that into my practice as well. So it makes a lot of sense. You know, um, as I mentioned in the very beginning, you're one of the co-hosts of the low carb MD podcast. I have a podcast with Mike. Um, I have a co-host friend and she absolutely loves both of you and says that you have both changed. I mean, Laura Spass, she was on your uh, podcast and she absolutely loves you and always raves about you of all the people you've interviewed for so many years now what are some big ticket items or tips that you can recommend to the people that are listening and watching right now that you've learned across your journey as being a podcast host well what i've learned i think mostly is not to be fanatical Mm -hmm. right i think i've talked to sean baker who's carnivore and i go sean why are you carnivore why do you eat only meat because i want to eat fruit i get fat and i don't (laughs) like vegetables and if i eat other stuff i get fat i'm okay well, I'm not going to argue with you. That's what he does. And that's what's working for him. Right. Sure. And other people will have a higher fat ketogenic diet. Other people will lower fat. So it's, it's really, I've learned just in dealing with patients too. And I apply what I learned from other people to my patients. So the interviews I've done have been so fantastic. And I have another podcast called life's best medicine where oh, I okay. you know, kind of go behind the curtain and talk about like, what motivates you? What do you enjoy? What do you, what annoys you? What do you, you know, what's life's best medicine for you? What do you do when you're stressed? What do you do when everyone's against you? Those kind of things. And I've had the pleasure of having, you know, Professor Noakes and, and Gary Fetke and so many great docs on. And, and what I've realized is it's really the people who like they, they'll question the science and look and say, OK, this is what everyone's saying. But my patients aren't sh- demonstrating that. Right. So I have to look at my patient success and go, OK, look, if your carnivore is not working, let's try some a different approach. Or if you're eating a high fat ketogenic diet, let's try tapering the fat down. If you're eating a low fat ketogenic diet, it's not working. Maybe we have to go up a little bit on it. Right. And I've seen all of those things work. So people will argue, uh, you know, calories in, calories out. Do calories matter? Well, if you're eating 10,000 calories of butter a day, you're going to gain weight. So (laughs) to say calories don't matter at all is probably not. But but I think what we're we're confusing the picture of satiety is what matters. Mm -hmm. Like if you eat 300 calories a day and you have satiety and you're and that's enough for your body and you're not you know doing something great. But if you're you're a triathlete, you're going to need more calories necessarily, right? So it, it depends if you're trying to lose weight, gain weight, get your sugars under control. So I think it's that where where I've learned really is is looking at that individual and saying, okay, this person is not going to be a hardcore, like I'm all in, I'm doing this. Let's put the training wheels on and start from that and, and go slowly. And they have to be okay with that. So if you're going to put the training wheels on, 
you, you have to know that it's going to be a slower process. If mm-hmm. you're sprinting and you're working out every day and you're doing all this stuff, you're, you're, you're going to run the marathon a quick, uh, on a faster pace. If you take a day off every week, then it's going to take you longer to run that marathon, right? You're, you're going to have to train differently. So that's what I think is, is really reaching out to people's expectations and saying, okay, where do you want to be? Do you want six pack abs? Okay. This is what's going to cost you to do that. Right. If you want to drive a Ferrari, it's going to cost you a lot. You're going to have to work hard and you're going to have to (laughs) make a lot of money to do that. Or you could say, Hey, I'll be happy with my car. And I don't, I could keep my wife and kids and family happy, you know, and not be in debt. So I think there's, you know, trade-offs in life. And and that's what I've learned is that, you know, really just looking at the individualized approach and seeing what works for that patient in front of you. And we can't just say, okay, everyone does keto. And I know, I know people who have been very successful and they go, everyone does this, this page, follow this page and go and do it. (laughs) Right. And it's not that easy because you know, and that like you made the point and, and I love that you made that point is the, the people that do research are working with mice in a lab. We're working with people who lost their mom to COVID. We're right. working with people whose husband just, you know, has dementia. And so that's a little different than saying, okay, here's 500 calories a day and go and eat that. And then, you know, we'll, we'll just change the ratios type thing. And it's <laughs> cravings and food and stress. And, you know, there's so many factors involved. Can you exercise? Do you have bad knees? And, you know, what, what can work for that person? But I think the biggest thing is giving people hope and saying, look, yes. I have people that, you know, I have a guy who came in yesterday who has advanced uh, colitis and he's miserable and no one's talked to him about diet. No, oh, I'm like, no. what are you doing here? And it just happens that he didn't know anything about my history on this stuff. And uh, one of his friends comes to me and goes, he likes you as a doctor. Okay. Uh, but in your case, I'm telling you there's stuff we can do. And because I've interviewed people who've reversed their colitis with dietary changes, right. you, you know, and they're not using their meds anymore or they're, or they're using it a lot less than they used to, whatever. And then you go, okay, there's hope. So he left here with hope saying, oh, I can make some changes. Maybe I'll cut out these processed foods out of my diet and I'll try eating real food and see what happens for a while. Yeah. Why don't we try it for two weeks? Can you do it for two weeks? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. We'll monitor you and see. So I think it's just, you know, that's what I've learned is really that the more experience I have is once I've treated someone with a certain condition, when that next person comes through the door, I go, yeah, we can help you. Cause I know it does. I know it works for someone else and it should work for you if we do it. Right. But the reality is, is the patient willing to do that? Are they willing right. to take those steps and give up certain things? Cause you know, I think over time, and it's a funny thing that I've noticed patients will come in and they go, okay, look, doc, I'm not going to do fasting ever. Like, don't, I know, you know, Jason Fung, I don't want to do fasting. Okay. You don't have to do fasting. It's not a big deal. And then two weeks later they go, guess what? I didn't eat yesterday. I was like, I thought you weren't going to do fasting. I don't know. I felt great. I didn't feel like eating. Okay. You fasted then. I thought you weren't going to do that. So, you know, those kind of things, when they feel better and when they get their insulin level down, they feel better and they can do certain things, you know, and then when their knees don't hurt and backs don't hurt anymore. So that's why I love having this variety of people on, you know, and saying what's working for you and then listening and not being arrogant and saying, okay, my way is the only way. Because then you start realizing, oh, maybe the gut microbiome has something to do with this. Maybe hormone levels. Maybe there's other people who are hormone experts I need to talk to if I can't break through with this patient and figuring out how you get a team that can help the patient, you know, ultimately. Yeah, I love that. And that was one of the biggest reasons I wanted to have you on is, I mean, I heard your talk in Boca and there's, um, I just love that you work with the individual. And it, then when when you work with an individual, you your everything you believe, like you cannot be dogmatic because there's no one way for every single person. And even if you had a one way cookie cutter diet, it also then will depend on the person's behavior and their history of if they're even going to do the diet. So I think it's so important having people on that really can share how it is working in the real world with real people that while, you know, you may have the perfect science or the perfect diet, you have to meet, like you said, at the very beginning, you have to meet your patient where they are, or nothing's going to stick. So it doesn't matter if you have this picture perfect diet, if it's not going to, if the, your community or your patient population is not going to adhere to it. And I love that of all your experiences, this just comes down to, you have to meet the client or patient where they are and help them with hope and the ability that they know that they can get better with whether it's diet or other levers you mentioned. Um, and it's so powerful. So thank you. So where can people find you? You know, so I, I know that you have a practice. Are you just local to California? Or do you see people outside of California? If you could well, just- I'm licensed now in California and Arizona. Okay. So, so I do see a, a lot of people okay. from Arizona, Northern California, California, mostly, but it's low carb MD, San Diego.com. Okay. Okay. Uh, and then I'm on life's best medicine podcast and low carb MD with Tro collision. And uh, yeah, those are, and you know, Twitter is the only social media. I, I oh, kind of okay. do Instagram, but I'm a rookie there. So I, I just, gosh, I, I guess I just spend more time on Twitter, just following other docs and learning from other people and seeing what's going on. 
but uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's where you find me. Well, thank you. I will put all of that in the show notes and thank you again for all your client stories. It's our patient stories. It's, it's always helpful to hear, you know, how it works in the real world. So thank you so much for your time. No, thanks for having me. It's an honor to come on. I love it. And you know, love what you're doing. I love that you're, we're kind of looking at the same approach. Like, let's yes. not be too dogmatic. Let's, let's see what helps that patient in front of us. And ultimately that's how we get successful. Yes. Yes. Well, thank you so much again. All right, Julie. Thank you. Okay. I hope that this interview was helpful. I hope that you found different levers and different different tools and little tricks that you can try. I will put a lot of the information he brought up in the show notes in terms of little gadgets or even supplements that you can try to maybe help improve sleep or help reduce stress or even the walks versus the runs and lowering sometimes your exercise and maybe upping some of the macros. But ultimately you have to find what works for you because not everything works for every specific person. And so if the influencer or leader or doctor doesn't look like you, doesn't have the same lifestyle as you, and if things are just different and they're advocating for something that this is what works, well, if your situation isn't the same metabolically, even lifestyle, then you may have to try different things that makes what works for you best. Only you know how you feel in your own body. And so you have to trust your intuition and the five levers of health that I recommend, which is sleep, stool, mood, energy, and hormones. But other than that, learn about information, but ultimately find what works for you and what works for you to allow you to be consistent and helps you to eat clean on most days. Not all days, but on most days. It's the long journey that we have to focus on when we are trying to have optimal health. Okay, guys, make sure to eat a lot of meat. Take care of your bodies because it is the only place you have to live. I will talk to you later. Bye, guys.